Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Hotep, which in the language of ancient Egypt means we come with justice in peace. Welcome to Freedom Now, a Saturday Pan-Africanist and International World Affairs program. Freedom Now is committed to the principle of the rights of all peoples and nations to self-determination. We thank you deeply for your contribution to KPFK, which permits programs like Freedom Now to stay on the air. In this era of corporate acquisition and co-optation of all dissident media, we provide the microphone challenging their corporate and racist point of view. So stay tuned for Agenda here at Freedom Now. Fellas, I'm ready to get up and do my thing. I want to get into it, man, you know. Peace, hoteps, and wisdom to all of our faithful and devoted listeners out there in the radio verse. This is Brother Brandon Sankara, and I want to start things off with a thank you to all of you listeners out there who continue to support Freedom Now through this latest season of Fun Drive. You keep us on our mission and allow us to bring you our agenda for today, Saturday, June 22nd, 2024. We begin with our very own treasure trove of wisdom, author, historian, and professor of African American Studies at the University of Houston, as well as Freedom Now co-producer, Dr. Gerald Horn. He's being joined on the line by Robert Chase, associate professor of history at Stony Brook University in New York, and author of the book, We Are Not Slaves, State Violence, Coerced Labor, and Prisoner's Right in Post-War America. Then, in the second half of our show, we'll be hearing from Sarah E. Johnson, Professor of Literature of the Americas at UC San Diego. For our purposes today, Professor Johnson will be joining us on the line with Dr. Horn to discuss her book, Encyclopédie Noir, The Making of Moreau de saint Marie's Intellectual World. Now, while we are in Fun Drive and still able to bring you this much quality content, we want to remind you to please support our efforts here at KPFK. Let's hear from the Sultan of Study himself, Dr. Gerald Horn, with a message for those who want to make their contribution to the station. Pledge a mere $100 and receive as a thank you gift the latest book from Gerald Horn. Hot off the presses, armed struggle. Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. Read about the distinctions drawn between and amongst armed propaganda, armed self-defense, and armed struggle. Read the first detailed analysis of the shootout at the UCLA campus in January 1969, leaving two Panthers dead. Read the first detailed analysis of the LAPD attack on Panther headquarters in December 1969. Read the first detailed analysis of the August 1970 shootout at the Marin County Courthouse featuring Pasadena teenager Jonathan Jackson in an alleged attempt to free his elder brother, George Jackson, and read of the role of the recently deceased political prisoner, Rochelle McGee. Read the first detailed analysis of the attempt at UCLA to fire Professor Angela Davis because of her membership in the U.S. Communist Party and her subsequent trial 
when she was charged with murder, conspiracy, and kidnapping during the aforementioned county courthouse shootout. Read the first detailed analysis of the Panthers' embassy abroad in Algeria, led by Eldridge Cleaver of Pasadena and Watts, in their attempt to build global solidarity for the Black liberation struggle. Read of the Panthers' solidarity delegations to the nation then known as the People's Republic of the Congo in Brazzaville, and of the Panthers' exile in socialist Cuba. Read of the connections between Hollywood communists and progressives, such as screenwriter Dalton Trumbo, actor Jane Fonda, actor Gene Seberg, screenwriter Donald Freed, basketball star Bill Walton, and producer Burt Schneider, and their support for the Panthers. Read of the severe repression visited upon radical and left-wing forces, which set the stage for the rise of paramilitary forces, often depicted as gangs, and the concomitant rise of the drug epidemic, especially crack cocaine. Read the first detailed analysis of the NAACP chapter in LA, especially the Beverly Hills Hollywood branch, which was a cash cow for the national organization, not least because of the contributions from celebrities like Sammy Davis Jr. Read of the roots of Kwanzaa, the nationally celebrated Black American holiday. Above all, understand why historically Southern California has been in the vanguard of radicalism and revolutionary upsurges and how that spirit has yet to be squashed. Again, pledge a mere $100 and receive a signed copy of the latest book by Gerald Horn, Armed Struggle, with a question mark, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. So pick up the phone and dial 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Make your pledge and support our efforts here at Freedom Now. Of course, I'm going to be on the ones and twos as we pour this knowledge, making sure your mental cup runneth over with revolutionary wisdom right here to quench your mental thirst on Freedom Now. KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles and KPFK.org streaming live on the web. To make sure we stay on a smooth ride with that cultural vibe you know and love, we'll be enjoying a musical bottom featuring Burna Boy, Harold Maburn, Gene Harris, Lisa Hilton, VJ Iyer, and McCoy Tyner. Now people get ready for this train at coming, taking you one step closer to mental liberation, and stay tuned for an interview with Dr. Gerald Horn and Professor Robert Chase. For KPFK Pacifica Radio, this is Gerald Horn, and with me on the line is Robert Chase, Associate Professor of History at Stony Brook University in New York, and author of the book, We Are Not Slaves, State Violence, Coerced Labor, and Prisoners' Rights in Postwar America. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Robert Chase. Well, thank you very much, Professor Horn, for having me on Freedom Now. I, uh, I am a longtime great admirer of yours, and uh, I'm really so thankful to reach your audience. And we're thankful to have you. So why did you decide to write this book? At the time that I was working on this in the early 2000s, as you know, um, the world and the country was mired in mass incarceration. Uh, with over 2.2 million people in prison, 6.5 million under the auspices of the criminal justice system from probation to parole to incarceration. And uh, yet, for the most part, historians were not centering 
mass incarceration into their analysis. In fact, we didn't even really have that term. And I was working on this in the early 2000s. And I remember sitting on the steps of a conference at Duke University for uh, the Labor uh, History and Working Class Association and talking with Professor Heather Thompson, who later went on to write the book on Attica about it and how this was this enormous absence in the literature. And I, I came at it as a civil rights and a labor historian. And I wanted to think about the prisoners' rights movement as an extension of the civil rights movement, as an extension also of uh, critiques of the state through black power and the Chicano movement. Uh, and yet um, no one had really heard about the Southern prisoner rights movement, particularly in Texas. And then I learned about this case called Ruiz v. Estelle. First filed in 1972, goes to trial in 1978. It's an eruption of the prisoners' rights movement. It comes from the very bowels of the prison itself, from the cell block to uh, civil rights, uh, put together by black and brown prisoners in particular with some white allies, going to trial in 1978 ending in 1980 and it was the longest running civil rights trial to date at that moment uh, and it included over 109 testimonies from prisoners themselves and this piqued my interest and so began uh, the start of my project which really was an intervention to thinking about labor and profitability in the prison system and the history of prisoners rights beyond the stories we knew at Attica in the north or California with George Jackson and wanting to include uh, southerner prisoners and particularly this story in Texas that I wrote about in We Are Not Slaves. So you mentioned the profitability of prisons. Does that have anything to do with what you call the agro-business model of prisons? Right. In fact, as uh, as you mentioned when we were talking earlier before we came on air, you know, I think it's important to name these prisons for what they are, because in Texas they use this standard metric near scientific like language of calling prisons units, units, thinking about what they count towards. But uh, in fact, they really are prison plantations in Texas. They built their prisons. Uh, literally on the grounds of former plantations. Before 1980, they were all in the Eastern Corridor, bordering Louisiana, around the old cotton fields and sugar districts. And there, prisoners uh, worked. So there's a change in prison law nationally in the 1930s, when the labor movement works with uh, the Roosevelt administration to remove the idea of private companies profiting from prison labor, so a turn away from the convict lease system. Then they had to turn to what was called state-made use, making things for the state. In the North, prisoners continue to work, yes, but in lesser numbers. In places like Texas, work was the center of their life. And I wanna be clear that for me, and for this work, work is more than the arrangement of what people do. Work uh, and labor structured racial difference, sexual power, uh, hierarchy within the system. So it was both the fact of work and the result of how the labor arrangement worked out. But on the fact of work, I'll give you just a couple of quick statistics. Texas was incredibly cheap. In 1951, the average daily cost of maintaining a prisoner in 44 states was $2.23. In Texas, it was 49 cents. In 1978, the year uh, uh, of the Ruiz case, Texas spent only $47 million to hold 23,000 prisoners. Whereas New York and California with prison populations less than Texas spent five times as much, 218 million for New York and 269 million for California. So it was cheap. And why was it cheap? Because the system was on, based on efficiency, order, 
low cost productivity. And this created a system that they claimed was more modern than the Northern or Western prison systems, more efficient, and most importantly, most controlled. So you seem to be saying that in the transition from slavery to non-slavery, enslaved plantations, plantations of the enslaved turned into almost literally prison plantations. Well, of course, and, tech, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No. And also, you use the phrase internal slave trade economy. What does that mean? So, uh, uh, two points. One, Texas doesn't pay prisoners for their labor. They still do not. Uh, and of course, it's a business um, that makes billions of dollars a year, including producing furniture for the universities in Texas. Uh, but what you're referring to is the reason why Texas was so cheap. They drew on a slave plantation past, the past of the slave driver system. And there they took prisoners who were known as trustees and they called them building tenders. Uh, they controlled the internal operation of the prison. But this was a remarkable arrangement. These building tenders had handmade weapons. And in return for the service, the prison administration gave them privileges that allowed them to control an internal economy. Uh, they controlled uh, the, an economy of money, food, human beings, reputations, favors, and sex. That all was a series of commodities to be bought and sold. So while prisoners worked the fields as literal coerced slave labor, picking cotton into the 1980s. So this we're not talking about the 1880s, we're talking about the 1970s and 1980s. These privileged prisoners, these trustees known as building tenders, constructed an internal slave trade economy where they bought and sold the bodies of other prisoners as sexual slaves, subjects of rape, and as domestic cell servants. Now, importantly, it also was a racially structured system. Building tenders in this system operated in a segregated prison environment of wings of African-American prisoners, white prisoners, and some uh, Chicano, Mexican-American prisoners mixed in, mostly in the white wings. But the people that held the most power in this building tender system were head building tenders, like Robert Barber. And they were invariably and always white. And they followed the warden or major that they worked for from prison to prison. And there they established a system of other building tenders underneath them and gave to them the privileges of the prison system by buying and selling other prison prisoners as bodies and subjects of sexual slavery. They literally could move them from one wing, cell, or prison to another because they also worked in the major's office. So one of the things that made Texas prisons so cheap was the fact that they relied so heavily on prisoners themselves to order, control, and manage the prison system. And it was that subject that became the center case of the case Ruiz v. Estelle. And I guess that brings us to Alan Lamar, an African-American Muslim who's part of your story, as well as Ernest McMillan. Talk to us about these two men. They are really emblematic of so many prisoners. I write about a whole cast of characters, uh, Chicano prisoners, black prisoners, and some white prisoners who created a formation in a system that was otherwise racially segregated of a racially integrated uh, black and brown with some white support uh, prisoners' rights movement, where they all saw themselves conditioned and named 
themselves. That's what was so remarkable as slaves, using the language of slavery as an alternative truth-telling narrative against the prison's uh, story of an agribusiness success story. So it was a truth-telling story. The two prisoners that you named are, are remarkable people. Ernest McMillan went to Morehouse College, uh, was the son of a well-known doctor in Georgia, uh, joined the NAACP in high school, then joined SNCC. And as SNCC uh, becomes a black power organization, he embraces that wholeheartedly. He forms in Dallas uh, uh, SNCC in a local Dallas chapter. And during a demonstration at the OK supermarket uh, over what was what was called at the time, quote unquote, ghetto gouging, um, driving up the prices in black communities, uh, a, a bottle of milk uh, was broken and they charged him with $250 worth of damage. He also uh, was avoiding the draft in Vietnam and he's thrown into the Texas prison system. And there in 1973, an incident known as the Father's Day incident where uh, nine uh, prisoners refused to work on a Sunday, which was the only day that they didn't work. In this model, they worked six days a week, 10, 11 hour days from sunup to sundown. That was a Sunday, that was Father's Day. He refused to work and he and these nine prisoners are run down a corridor of building tenders and prison guards, beaten, thrown in underwear, made to work in the hot sun, and made a public example of. Out of that arrangement, Ernest then sued the prison system, uh, relied on his mother, who was a civil rights advocate at the time, to get his story out, then worked with Mickey Leland, who at the time was a Texas state legislator, as well as Edie Bernice Johnson, both of whom will go on to represent uh, Texas uh, in the House of Representatives, a position Edie Bernice Johnson still has. And later, when he gets out of Texas, he uh, joins uh, uh, Congresswoman Johnson's office. But this story is about the ways in which prisons are, are permeable, uh, that the narratives of civil rights, one, got people into prison. So to some extent, they were political prisoners, but that didn't mean that their ties to external communities, to the black power movement, to the civil rights movement was severed. No, they reached out, they broadened that story, and then they made it a public story as both Edie Bernice Johnson and Mickey Leland would then go on to head uh, the Joint Prison Reform Committee to try to reform the Texas system. Very briefly, Alan Lamar's story, uh, he was a black Muslim prisoner, uh, or at least the prison system named him as such. And in Texas, what they did with Muslims was to segregate them. They thought of every political ideology as if it was a disease. And they would segregate them, they would quarantine them, they would try to cut them off from the rest of other prisoners. And of course, the entire prisoners' rights movement first really begins with Muslim prisoners. First in the 1950s, during an era when prisoners uh, were converting to Islam from Malcolm X uh, to a whole host of other people, including Alan Lamar. And then um, what, what Texas did would put the toughest, meanest white building tenders like Robert Barber over these prisoners to engage in sexual violence, physical force, uh, and domination. Eventually, Alan Lamar would go on to write a lawsuit that would uh, racially integrate the Texas prison system, a successful lawsuit. But he's an interesting story because apparently he did so in part because another prisoner who was white was also his lover, and he wanted that person in his cell with him. And what that goes to show, I think, is a more intersectional story where racial and sexual power of domination by the state through these building tender or trustee systems came up against people who were black, who were white, who were Chicano, who also had social relations amongst themselves. 
and wanted to share in that. And Alan Lamar's uh, lawsuit eventually overturned racial segregation in the Texas prison system. Finally, Robert Chase, author of the book, We Are Not Slaves, talk to us about the Free Alabama Movement. Oh my goodness. Uh, the Free Alabama Movement um, in so many ways reminds me of um, my book, We Are Not Slaves, and draws on that history. The Free Alabama Movement was um, critical in the 2016 first ever, but very limited reporting from media sources of the first ever nationwide prison strike. They and the end prison uh, slavery in Texas movement joined with prisoners all across the nation to make clear that they remained slaves of the state. They uh, called their manifesto uh, ceasing to be slaves, not in uh, 1865, uh, but in 2016. And uh, their, their uh, leadership, including uh, a prisoner by the name of Kinetic Justice, um, began uh, to organize prisoners around their labor and engaged in a series of labor strikes. Now, as we speak in Alabama right now, they are under the auspices of a Justice Department investigation on similar systems of internal sexual slavery, sexual assault, and extreme brutality. The Justice Department has issued a report. If one were to read it, it would make your blood curl and boil at the same time. Um, and what happened to Kinetic was that in the midst of engaging in another uh, labor strike, I believe in 2021, uh, he was beaten savagely by prisoner guards uh, and uh, had to be flown to the University of Alabama's prison hospital where he has lost the sight of one eye. Yet the Free Alabama Movement and the resistance uh, within Alabama continues and they are beginning to uh, open society's eyes to the ongoing stories of enslavement within our prisons, uh, to the ongoing stories of coerced labor, of physical abuse, of cell isolation, uh, and of sexual assault that really, you know, in my book, I call it state orchestrated because the state benefited from the building tender system. And in many ways, when the system becomes incredibly rapacious and violent, uh, that is reproducing the model of what mass incarceration wants to create, which is a divided prison society, divided amongst themselves, so that resistance is more difficult to achieve. Mm. Well, I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there. Robert Chase, author of the book, we are not slaves, state violence, coerced labor, and prisoners' rights in post-war America. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. Thank you, Professor Horn. It was my pleasure. Special thanks to Professor Chase for sharing his work with us. Where else can you get such quality content, context, and historical perspective other than Freedom Now? Dr. Horn, talk to the people about what they can expect as a thank you for donating to the station, KPFK, today. Pledge a mere $100 and receive as a thank you gift the latest book from Gerald Horn, Hot Off the Presses, Armed Struggle. Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. Read about the distinctions drawn between and amongst armed propaganda, armed self-defense, and armed struggle. Read the first detailed analysis of the shootout at the UCLA campus in January 1969, leaving two Panthers dead. Read the first detailed analysis of the LAPD attack on Panther headquarters in December 1969. Read the first detailed analysis of the August 1970 shootout at the Marin County Courthouse featuring Pasadena teenager Jonathan Jackson 
in an alleged attempt to free his elder brother, George Jackson, and read of the role of the recently deceased political prisoner, Rochelle McGee. Read the first detailed analysis of the attempt at UCLA to fire Professor Angela Davis because of her membership in the US Communist Party and her subsequent trial when she was charged with murder, conspiracy, and kidnapping during the aforementioned county courthouse shootout. Read the first detailed analysis of the Panthers embassy abroad in Algeria, led by Eldridge Cleaver of Pasadena and Watts and their attempt to build global solidarity for the black liberation struggle. Read of the Panthers solidarity delegations to the nation then known as the People's Republic of the Congo in Brazzaville and of the Panthers' exile in socialist Cuba. Read of the connections between Hollywood communists and progressives such as screenwriter Dalton Trumbo, actor Jane Fonda, actor Gene Seberg, screenwriter Donald Freed, basketball star Bill Walton, and producer Burt Schneider, and their support for the Panthers. Read of the severe repression visited upon radical and left-wing forces, which set the stage for the rise of paramilitary forces, often depicted as gangs, and the concomitant rise of the drug epidemic, especially crack cocaine. Read the first detailed analysis of the NAACP chapter in LA, especially the Beverly Hills Hollywood branch, which was a cash cow for the national organization not least because of the contributions from celebrities like Sammy Davis Jr. Read of the roots of Kwanzaa, the nationally celebrated Black American holiday. Above all, understand why historically Southern California has been in the vanguard of radicalism and revolutionary upsurges and how that spirit has yet to be squashed. Again, pledge a mere $100 and receive a signed copy of the latest book by Gerald Horn, Armed Struggle, with a question mark, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. So pick up the phone and dial 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735 or go online to kpfk.org to donate right now and make your support for the show and the station felt. Now, getting right back into it, we're going to send you right back off to Dr. Gerald Horn, who's now being joined by Professor Sarah E. Johnson. Take it away, Dr. Horn. For Pacifica Radio, KPFK Los Angeles, this is Gerald Horn. And with me on the line is Sarah E. Johnson, Professor of Literature of the Americas at the University of California, San Diego, and author of the book, Encyclopedia Noir, The Making of Moreau de saint Marie's Intellectual World. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Johnson. Good morning, Professor Horn. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. I'm excited well, to you. talk about the book. Oh, good. Thank you. I appreciate that. So why did you write this book? Why did I write this book? Well, this is a book it took me a, over a decade to write, and I began it because um, my earlier work, I've, um, I studied the Haitian Revolution, and I'm very interested in the repercussions of the Haitian Revo uh, Revolution in other parts of the Americas. So, for example, my earlier work, you know, studies the after kind of the aftershocks of the revolution in places like Cuba or the Dominican Republic or the United States. And so, when you work on colonial Saint Domingue or you study the Haitian Revolution, kind of one of the main primary sources you always find yourself turning back to is the work of Moreau de Saint Mary. He was sort of the uh, you know, kind of the Caribbean Thomas Jefferson, if you will. He was an um, he was an intellectual who had a long uh, long career as a statesman, as a diplomat. He wrote a ton of material 
Um, and he was also a slave owner. So I wrote this book because I had been using his archives for years. His archives, his personal papers, his map collections, his book collection, um, they're sort of the cornerstone of the French colonial archive in Aix-en-Provence. And so I had been studying and using this archive for a long time. And it became very clear at some point that I had a book to write about him, that in fact, I needed to write a book about knowledge production, about kind of the kin and kinship communities that survived in the shadows of the slaveholder, about, you know, in fact, all all of the, the enslaved Africans and, sla uh, and free people of color who made his work possible. So that's how the project um, started. So I assume you're a Black American, and that raises in my mind the question of how did you come to learn French? How did you come to study Haiti? I am um, an African American woman. I grew up in Baltimore City and I grew up, um, you know, I went to public school from K to, uh, K to 12. And I went to these wonderful public schools that really believed in foreign language education. So I started studying Latin and French um, in elementary and middle school, continued that study into high school and Haiti, you know, the first, I think probably a lot of people will say one of their first introductions to the Haitian Revolution was reading um, CLR James' Black Jacobins and it really totally changed my world. Um, I had been studying French for a long time and when um, I read that book, a lot of things kind of coalesced in for me. Um, and so that history, um, I actually, my father's family is all from rural Mississippi. And one of my um, ancestors, he was actually from the French Caribbean as well. He had um, been brought here as an enslaved person um, into Virginia and then sold down into Mississippi. And so these were stories that I had grew up, uh, grown up hearing. Um, and so this connection to Haiti, Martinique, Guadeloupe, it was something that was personal for me as well as this sort of inspiring story of the, you know, the establishment of the first um, independent, you know, nation in the Americas that was born out of a successful rebellion of the enslaved. So, um, you know, the story of the revolution is just, it's something I've been studying for decades now. <laughs> um, and um, all of my work in some way, you know, kind of returns to these, uh, to these themes. So that's how I learned French. I learned it in school um, and then went on to study other languages. Um, I spent a lot of time living abroad in Cuba and West Africa um, in Martinique for a little while. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I see. So you mentioned your subject's casual sadism. What did you mean? Uh. So Mahol was a man who wrote, he's really, you know, he was a lawyer, I should say first, um, and he compiled a slate, you know, a code about laws in the Caribbean. So not just in Saint-Domingue, um, he was born in Martinique originally and was educated in Paris and then came back to, to colonial Saint-Domingue, which is at the time the richest, one of the richest slaveholding societies, richest colonies in the world. Um, produced sugar, coffee, indigo, for example. And he, um, he was a man who did these law, you know, these law, produced these books of law, but he also produced these descriptions. He called the description, right? These descriptions of colonial life. And when he would be writing about his sources, about the culture of the Caribbean, um, he would mention in these very casual ways, sort of the excesses, the extreme violence that undergirded the system in order to produce so much wealth. The only way to do that was through the massive exploitation and forced labor um, and genocide, really, of, you know, thousands of people. So I'll just give you one example in the book. Um, you know, the book has several chapters that are formatted as an encyclopedia, right? And so I often would have these tiny fragments of information about people, particularly the enslaved Africans who worked for him, who lived around him, who he studied. And there was one man named Jean-Baptiste, and he was an enslaved person who Moho um, wrote about him as a way of talking about how he talked about frivolité, how frivolous, um, how, how black people were able to, um, who, that they hurt themselves for frivolous reasons. So this was a man who, over the course um, of a few months, he developed a way to, he made a wooden prosthetic, right? And he figured out a way to sever his own arm. Um, and he did this, Moho says, because he wanted to escape the monotony of slavery, right? So Moho wrote these, writes these horrible stories, right, about the 
casual violence of the of a place like Saint Domingue, about the ways that people chose to um, evade the restrictions of slavery, the way they chose to harm themselves. He writes about the, the suicide of the enslaved, and he does this this in this remarkable, casual voice in this. Um, Often with, you know, trying to use humor to talk about these absolutely existentially terrible um, circumstances. So he was, in fact, I would say a sadist, right? Um, and he made his living writing about these things, right? So he becomes an authority about colonial life back in France. He's published widely in agricultural journals. Um, in pamphlets and what have you. He becomes an authority on the Caribbean, but he does this by making light of the suffering of thousands of human beings. You mentioned in your book the employment of sources in the Kakongo language, a uh, language spoken in Congo and Northern Angola. Elaborate on that. Yeah, this is one of the chapters in the book, uh, chapter six, and to some extent, chapter seven. Um, I worked for a long time with this vocabulaire. It's a phrase book, really, that comes out in 1803. And it was produced by uh, a man named Baudry de Lozier, who was Moho's brother-in-law. And it's this remarkable text, um, actually, that is, it's a series of words. So it's written in French and Kikongo. And it's a series of words, but then of phrases. So to give you an example, words like, you know, sugar or master or love or, you know, all of these phrases appear, whip, right? Um, and then the phrases, um, all these words appear. And then the phrases will be things like, your mother gave birth to a pig or you are, you are a poisoner. Some really disgusting ones like, do you love me? You know, so you have to imagine this is the master class who has you know, compiled this dictionary and phrase book because there, you know, and his reason, his rationale is that you could make the enslaved understand how much you cared for them if you could speak to them in their own language, right? And so what I really did with this phrase book is I flipped it on its head and to talk about all of the violence, um, particularly the sexual violence that was um, inflicted against enslaved women, just based on the kind of vocabulary um, you know, that was showing up. So uh, that chapter really works a lot with the Congolese Atlantic. There's been some wonderful scholarship um, about really trying to reinstate the importance of um, the Congo um, in, in the Americas. And one of the things I was particularly drawn to was um, just the conviction that when we're studying colonial Saint-Domingue, we can't study it only through French sources. We can't study it only through Creole sources, right? We really have to understand that the, at the moment where one of the most important revolutions of the modern world was happening, that the languages that people were speaking on the ground were African languages, in this particular case, Kikongo. And this text, this kind of, you know, this artifact from 1803, gave me a way to really start to get into the linguistic diversity of that world. Mm. You also discuss Maroons, that is to say, mm. the slaves who escaped the jurisdiction of the enslaver and set up their own communities. For example, in the hills of Santo Domingo, for, for exactly. example. But could you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, you know, it's very clear if you read the Affiche Américaine, for example, which was um, a periodical that appeared for several decades in Saint-Domingue, and there are ads for people who have run away, you know, all the time, right? And many people are headed to the hills, right? They're headed into some of the northern um the northern areas along the border, they're headed, headed into the mountains um, that kind of nestle between what is now the Dominican Republic um, and Haiti. Um, and Mohol, because he wrote this, um, because he left us kind of one of the most detailed examinations of the geographies of colonial Saint-Domingue, he also wrote, I should mention, a whole separate um, two-volume piece on, or a one-volume piece on Santo Domingo on the on the eastern side of the island. So he was always interested in the connections between what becomes Haiti and the, you know and and the Dominican Republic. And he often you know mentioned these maroons in passing. Um, and so part of the book really um, you know it's very interested in the people who chose to run away, who managed to escape, right, um, and tries to go back and recover some of their histories. Hmm. And he winds up fleeing to Philadelphia. Why did he flee? Yeah, so Mohol had a very, um, a very checkered life. A very um, he was he was in exile many times. So he had left. You know, as I mentioned, he was born in Martinique. He ends up in Saint Domingue, working as a lawyer and as a magistrate. 
he goes to France to um, publish some of these law, you know, these law books and what have you. And while he's there, the the French Revolution. Um, be, you know, begins. Um, he's very involved in the early days of the French Revolution, and in 1793 he has to flee France um, during what becomes known as the Terror, right? And so he ends up going to Philadelphia. He um, was one of many planters um, who ends up actually in the United States in places like Norfolk and New York and Baltimore um, and Philadelphia. You have to remember that Philadelphia at the time was very connected to um, the Caribbean, right? There was a very big trade network um, or very big volume of trade going on. And so there's a whole French exile community, both people who were fleeing the French Revolution and people who were fleeing revolution in the Caribbean. And they kind of coalesced in Philadelphia which is a city at the time, um, you know, where French was widely spoken. Um, these communities kind of gathered and Moho opened a bookstore there and he, he opened a printing shop. And so, you know, my book actually looks a lot at, you know, print typography and what it meant to actually work as a printer because some of the work that he's most well known for was actually printed during those four years that he was working in Philadelphia. And he printed it, you know, he learned to become a printer himself, right? And so the book really tries to use, um, not just to pay attention to the words and to express its arguments through the content, but also to think about the way that the words are produced. So there are a lot of chapters, for example, where print is upside down, where I'm really working with the materiality of the book trade at the moment, um, because Moho himself was very involved in the book trade. And there's a whole, um, you know, a theme of the book that really is connecting print culture and the production of knowledge um, to slavery. So in other words, all these beautiful books that he produced in Philadelphia, they were some of the most aesthetically um, advanced books that were produced um, in the early United States, right? This would absolutely not have been possible if he was not selling human beings alongside, you know, the typeface that he was importing from England, for example. So there's mm. really a connection between slavery and print culture, even when he was writing about things that were not ostensibly about slavery. For example, he wrote about China. He wrote one of the earliest, um, he, he printed, he edited, translated, and published a book about China, one of the earliest books about China that was published in the United States. Mm. You also mentioned a comrade of his, a fellow enslaver by the name of Von mm. Brahm, who had roots in South Carolina, although he had interests in the Dutch world. Yes. Was there the possibility of Van Brahm sending his enslaved Africans from South Carolina to South Africa or even Indonesia, for example? Uh, this is a great question. So this is the same, um, this is the relationship that he developed with a man named Van Brahm, who was in, in fact Dutch. He was very involved in the China trade. He was living what was then called Canton, right? Canton. He was um, a trader. He had connections with South Africa, with Indonesia, with China. And he, um, when he left China in 1795, he'd actually been part of this celebrated, one of the earliest trips to see um, uh, the Forbidden City, right? And so he did this two-year embassy um, in China. And when he came to Philadelphia, he established this house in the Pennsylvania woods that he called the Chinese Retreat. And so uh, Moho worked with him. This was a man um, who had also been living in South Carolina. Um, and uh, it was a very exciting moment because, you know, I looked through tons of newspapers trying to find evidence that he also enslaved people in South Carolina. He was a rice, um, he produced rice. Um, and I did find several people that he, you know, that ran away from him, what have you. I don't know. It's a super intriguing question to think about whether any of these people he took with him when he returned, when he left South Carolina, he went back to China for a few years and then he came to Philadelphia. So I have no evidence that he actually took any of his enslaved people with him to China. But what I do have, and it's, you know, I found this in several newspapers. Um, there's been a little bit written about five Chinese men that he brought from China into Philadelphia who, you know, he had working in his home. There was also a woman from Indonesia. Um, so it, at this home in Philadelphia, you really see this, co you know, this um, 
this moment of global empire, you know, coalescing in this Philadelphia home. And I write a little bit and I, you know, speculate a little bit what that would have meant for someone like Moho, who was at the time, you know, at the time that he had been forced to flee Saint-Domingue, right? This is when the Haitian Revolution has um, broken out. And there's a possibility that people are going to lose their enslaved African laborers. Like, this is a moment when Moho can speculate about well, what would happen if we have enslaved laborers from other parts. And of course, this is what comes to pass in places like Martinique or Guadeloupe or you know, the Guyanas, for example, where um, planters bring, um, you know, they bring in laborers from India and China, for example, um, at the moment of emancipation and other in the British and the French colonies, for example. Mm. Finally, Professor Sarah E. Johnson, Professor of Literature of the Americas at the University of California, San Diego. What's next on your research agenda? <laughs> A long rest. Um, <laughs> I'm actually working on... There was this amazing um, uh, scholar, he was a journalist. Um, I wrote about him in my last book, his name was Cyril Bizet, um, and he did this newspaper in the 1830s and 1840s. And it was this amazing um, set, it was very long publications that um, he worked on that were really this early African diasporic journalistic um, attempt to unite um, people of color all over the world in this in a discussion of slavery and emancipation. So there have um, there's a new digital edition of this uh, digital edition that's also going to be a translated edition. This was a newspaper that was produced in French. So I'm on the editorial board. Um, working on this project to bring it to a wider reading public. I'm also working on some family history. Um, and I've been working a little bit on this Jesuit priest um, in Saint-Domingue who lived in Saint-Domingue for several decades who studied African languages. So that's taken me down, um, you know, just kind of the path of exploring kind of what, um, in more detail, some of the other African languages that were um, very, um, popular and prominent in Saint-Domingue at the time, and particularly how people studied them. So those are just a couple of the projects that I have kind of <laughs> in the hopper at the moment. Just a footnote on that last point, beyond Kikongo, what are the other African languages that you're referring to? Well, Kikongo is one of the main ones um, that I'm really interested in, but uh, Fon, Ewe, there are a couple of different ones, um, Wolof, um, and mm. what I don't know is how much, um, this is a man named Pierre Boutin, how much he might have documented, and so what um, I'm hoping is that I can make a trip to the Vatican to see if he left any papers um, to discover what other languages he might have been studying. Hmm. Well, good luck with that. And once again, <laughs> Thank you. Professor Johnson, we appreciate your joining us. Thank you for joining us on KPFK Freedom Now, Los Angeles. Thank you, Professor Horn. It's been a real honor. I'm a huge admirer of your work. Ditto. <laughs> Thank you so much. We now give special thanks to Professor Johnson for sharing her work with us. Let's hear once again from Dr. Horn about what you loyal listeners out there can expect as a thank you for donating to the station, KPFK, today. Pledge a mere $100 and receive as a thank you gift the latest book from Gerald Horn, Hot Off the Presses, Armed Struggle. Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. Read about the distinctions drawn between and amongst armed propaganda, armed self-defense, and armed struggle. Read the first detailed analysis of the shootout at the UCLA campus in January 1969, leaving two Panthers dead. Read the first detailed analysis of the LAPD attack on Panther headquarters in December 1969. Read the first detailed analysis of the August 1970 shootout at the Marin County Courthouse featuring Pasadena teenager Jonathan Jackson in an alleged attempt to free his elder brother George Jackson and read of the role of the recently deceased political prisoner, 
Michelle McGee. Read the first detailed analysis of the attempt at UCLA to fire Professor Angela Davis because of her membership in the U.S. Communist Party and her subsequent trial when she was charged with murder, conspiracy, and kidnapping during the aforementioned county courthouse shootout. Read the first detailed analysis of the Panthers' embassy abroad in Algeria, led by Eldridge Cleaver of Pasadena and Watts, and their attempt to build global solidarity for the Black liberation struggle. Read of the Panthers' solidarity delegations to the nation then known as the People's Republic of the Congo in Brazzaville and of the Panthers' exile in socialist Cuba. Read of the connections between Hollywood communists and progressives such as screenwriter Dalton Trumbo, actor Jane Fonda, actor Gene Seberg, screenwriter Donald Freed, basketball star Bill Walton, and producer Burt Schneider and their support for the Panthers. Read of the severe repression visited upon radical and left-wing forces, which set the stage for the rise of paramilitary forces, often depicted as gangs, and the concomitant rise of the drug epidemic, especially crack cocaine. Read the first detailed analysis of the NAACP chapter in LA especially the Beverly Hills Hollywood branch, which was a cash cow for the national organization, not least because of the contributions from celebrities like Sammy Davis Jr. Read of the roots of Kwanzaa, the nationally celebrated black American holiday. Above all, understand why historically, Southern California has been in the vanguard of radicalism and revolutionary upsurges and how that spirit has yet to be squashed. Again, pledge a mere $100 and receive a signed copy of the latest book by Gerald Horn, Armed Struggle, question mark, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. So pick up the phone and dial 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735 or go online to kpfk.org to donate right now and make your support for the show and the station felt. Nobody else can do this for us. No document can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign his own emancipation proclamation. In closing, we'd like to thank our guest, Professor Robert Chase from Stony Brook University in New York, as well as Professor Sarah E. Johnson from UC San Diego. Find a Black-owned bookstore near you today and get their books. Shout out to Dr. Gerald Horn for doing what he does best and guiding this train of mental liberation towards Pan-African enlightenment for yet another Saturday. Hit up your favorite bookstore right now and find one of Dr. Horn's many informative texts to enrich your library and your mind. Word to producer sister Tej. Much love to our spiritual backbone and Freedom Now founder Baba Didan Kamathi on the historical calendar. Shout out to our marvelous engineer, and last but certainly not least, thanks to all of our loyal listeners and supporters. It takes a village to build a revolution, and Freedom Now is a village to be reckoned with. This has been Brother Brandon Sankara, and you can join us on Facebook at Freedom Now Gerald Horn. You can email the program at freedomnow at kpfk.org or go online to our audio archives at kpfk.org. Scroll down to find Freedom Now and you'll be able to hear this program as well as 60 days worth of prior programming here at KPFK 90.7 FM. We now send you off to our sister Assumpta with Spotlight Africa coming up next with issues facing Mama Africa. And until next Saturday here at Freedom Now, we stand running our marathon. Ready for revolution.